You ready? I'm ready. Welcome to Cockpits and Cocktails, the lively aviation podcast, where we talk about all things aviation and aerospace. So please grab a cocktail and let's chill out and talk about some aviation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Cockpits and Cocktails podcast. Um, And I have a special guest. This will be the second male that we've had on the podcast. And this is my dad, Larry Heiser. Hi, Dad. Oh, Natalie. How are you? I'm just fine. How are you doing? I'm good. Have you been on a podcast before? I have not been on a podcast. No. no. Okay. I wanted to bring you on because parents are usually pretty influential in what, what their kids do. And I'm um, just a short little intro. Um, my dad has been a pilot and he's going to talk a little bit about that. He was in the Navy and flew for the airlines a little bit and then flew for FedEx. And this is mostly what I know. I've never flown with him as a passenger where he's been the pilot. So interestingly, I can say there was some influence um, from him because I knew whatever it was he was doing when he was away was pretty cool because he would get back and he would always have these cool gifts and people in our small town would kind of flock around him and and want to talk to him about where he'd been and what he was flying and I didn't know much about what he did and and I have to say I wasn't really that interested but I knew whatever he did people were interested in it and and it was cool I want to hear from you, Dad, how you got started in aviation. Well, it happened a long time ago. As you know, I'm from the country. I'm from a very rural area. Uh, I live, you know, about uh, three miles from nowhere. But I guess I was probably about 13 years old when we had a puddle jumper uh, that came to visit. He landed down in the bottom uh, over here near our house, and everybody was flocking down to see the airplane and find out what was going on. My dad thought he had crashed. Uh, and I didn't know anything about airplanes. And this was the first airplane that uh, I ever saw that was on the ground. I've seen a bunch of them overhead, you know, flying with the contrails and stuff. Uh, but I, he was offering rides for $5 each. And uh, I wanted to go fly, but uh, my mom and dad wouldn't let me. And uh, so I, I guess that was the first time I've ever, well, it was the first time that I ever seen inside of an airplane. And saw that funny looking steering wheel they had to fly with. And, of course, I didn't know what it was other than a steering wheel. I knew they had to have something like that. But uh, after I saw that airplane, I I really wasn't all that excited about it. I mean, it wasn't much to look at. Uh, But uh, when I graduated from high school, I retired from farming because farming is hard work. And I didn't like it very well. So I went to college. And uh, while I was in college, of course, the Vietnam War was escalating. And at that time, all the guys uh, were being uh, drafted uh, into the Army uh, to go overseas. I didn't really want to go into the Army. So uh, my senior year, uh, they told us that uh, we would be uh, drafted by Christmas and that uh, be prepared for it. So I had a real good friend from uh, the nearby town that uh, came to me and said, Larry, let's learn how to fly airplanes. I don't want to go to the jungles of Vietnam. And I said, well, Mark, let's do it. So uh, he said, let's take the, the Navy test and learn how to fly. Of course, I didn't think the Navy had airplanes. All they had were ships. So I was sort of set back with that a little bit. But in any event, we took the test for the Navy. And uh, next thing I know, when I graduated from, uh, from college, you know, I was uh, a month later, I was in Pensacola uh, learning how to fly airplanes. And it's very exciting. Of course, I graduated in uh, June. Uh, Your oldest sister was born in June. And then I was in the Navy in July. So it came very, very fast. Anyway, I guess when I got to Pensacola, you know, they uh, taught taught us how to fly. And then the first airplane was the T-34. So within uh, a month, I was already soloing uh, the T-34. And it was very exciting. We did everything, you know, we went out and did acrobatics, formation flying, and just really getting really comfortable in the airplane itself. I guess I was 22 years old, as a matter of fact, when I entered the Navy. And then uh, actually shortly thereafter, when I was 23, 
I had already landed and taken off of an aircraft carrier. And then when I was 23, I had earned my uh, Navy aviator wings, which was a big deal. Wow. So, you know, I was, I was fairly young at that time because I never had known anything about flying. And the Navy's training was very quick. It was very demanding, very thorough. You know, we were doing solos. We were doing acrobatics. We were doing instrument training, cross-country training, the uh, carrier landings day and night single and multi-engine and that all transpired within a couple of years when i had got my wings down, finally while i was down in corpus christi they gave uh, gave us the opportunity to choose the area that we wanted to to uh, fly in the fleet and i chose the uh, p3 airplane and i, I like the fact that it was big and uh, i just thought maybe that after i did my navy stand i might get out and get a job with the airlines uh, with an airplane like that but um, anyway, P3 was cool. That was that was a nice airplane. In case your listeners don't know what a P3 is, surely they'll look it up. But in any event, you know, it's a four-engine turboprop. It has top speed of about 350 knots. It has a crew of 12 guys on there. And we chased submarines or anything else that we saw in the water that we thought would be interesting. It was fun flying. We would fly down to 300 feet in the daytime, fly down to 500 feet at night. And we got trained in celestial navigation and mining and the harpoon missiles, uh, special weapons, torpedoes. We could just about do just about anything. And most of the missions were 12 hour missions and, you know, overseas and to Sicily and Spain and Portugal and Iceland, Bermuda. We had several uh, different locations that we flew out of like that. Uh, while I was in the Navy, I also had the opportunity to get checked out in their uh, VIP airplane, the C-131, which is just a little old two-engine reciprocating airplane. But it was it was fun to fly also. Let me stop you. <laughs> that was really fast. That was a lot of training really fast. What were you, did you find it really difficult? Did you, you know, ever struggle with anything in particular during your training that, that you had a hard time with? No, not really. I, the instructors always graded you on each flight. And uh, if you didn't do good, then you would get a down, they would call uh, it, make the people, you know, fly that flight all over again. Maybe they did something wrong in acrobatics, or maybe they did an instrument approach incorrectly or something like that. I never got a down, thank goodness. I don't know why, because I, like I said, I had no experience in airplanes at all. I was very fortunate. And uh, yes, it was very hard. Uh, yeah. Even the 234, as minor as it was, I had never studied that hard, you know, for for an airplane before. Yeah. Uh, and you got into uh, aerodynamics. Uh, aerodynamics is, uh, you know, that's pretty deep training. Uh, but uh, something essential, if you're going to be a, an aviator, then you need to know a little bit how an airplane flies. Yeah. So, so once you got yeah, yeah, it, was pretty- it, when you were learning and, you know, the more you were into it, the more did you feel like, you know, this is because it's such a different life that, that you had before. Did you feel validated like this was the right choice? This was you could see a whole future in, in aviation. Well, in the, in the Navy, in the in the training and stuff, by the time you well, you didn't go in there and I mean, it was going to fail. I mean, you know, I'm, that's the wrong attitude to have. You know, you got to think, yeah, I can do this. Uh, and by the time you get familiar with the T-34, they take you off the T-34, put you on a bigger airplane, the T-28, uh, to do the carrier landing zone. And by the time you get really comfortable with the T-28, they send you somewhere else like Corpus Christi, and you learn the multi-engine airplane uh, and learn how to land on the carrier with it also. So every airplane you go to, it's always a nerve wracking experience because you weren't familiar with the airplane. But once you get familiar with it, then yeah, no problems at all. Yeah. Same thing with the P3. Initially, yeah, it was tough. Eventually, you realize that that is a good airplane. <laughs> you started flying the P3 and then what happened? After the P3 and the C-131 VIP airplane, then uh, I retired from the Navy after 20 years. I think it was 1989. Yeah, it was. And then I started working for a little small uh, commuter airline, uh, Northwest Airlink, that was uh, out of Memphis. Uh, and I threw the Saab uh, aircraft in that one. And for almost five years, I guess it was, until oh, I, I was finally hired. By- I didn't realize you it didn't was know that long. I, flew- I was thinking it was like maybe yeah. two years. Wow. 
No, it was like four and a half, five years. But yeah. At that time, you know, all the airlines, they were not hiring at all. You know, it was putting people in pools. And I got put in a pool at FedEx. But after, like I said, about five years, I finally got called up to fly with them. You really wanted to fly cargo or did you, did you not like the airlines? Was it always your goal to get to cargo or how did that come to be? Well, that little five years I had with uh, Northwest Air Link made you realize that a lot of people are not happy with the way you fly the airplane. They see they're too hot, too cold, or it's too bumpy. You know, how come we can't get there faster? Why are you going so slow? Uh, why did you do this? You know, it, they was all, always questioning what you were doing. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, I was very, I was very determined to get out of flying passengers. I mean, I could have advanced further uh, with passengers, but I felt like that boxes don't talk back to you. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so, plus the pay scale at FedEx is probably, it was better than the airlines. And uh, they had some pretty cool airplanes at FedEx at the time that I was hired. You know, I started flying on the Boeing 727. Uh, after 727, I went to the DC-10. After DC-10, I went to the Airbus 300. And the good thing was I, I had made captain in each of those three airplanes, but the Airbus was my favorite. It was a uh, comfortable airplane. It was, uh, I don't know. It's just, it was an awesome airplane. <laughs> and how long did you do that? How long were you with at FedEx? I was with FedEx for 18 years. Uh, I wish I could have been longer, but uh, you know, the, when you meet the FAA requirement to retire after age 65 now, and I didn't have a, a choice. And so out I went. What were some of your favorite airplanes and what did you really like about, like, what did you like about flying with the Navy? What did you like about flying with the airlines? And what did you like about flying with FedEx? Pluses and minuses of each. Well, the, the plus of the military is that it, it was fun. <laughs> I mean, we were doing different things. We weren't, I mean, we were going to point A to point B, Really from point A to point C, because B was about eight to 10 hours doing different things at different altitudes down low, you know, at 300 feet, a thousand feet, looking for submarines or practicing mining, uh, doing 45 degree angle turns while you're off the autopilot and whatnot. In fact, my favorite experience, it really, it was very positive for me. I had a, my mentor was a Lieutenant commander at the time. And we went down to 300 feet. He told me to take it off the autopilot. So I was off the autopilot, 300 feet. He said, roll into a left 45 degree angle bank. I did that. He said, here, take my pen, my grease pen, and draw the electrical system on the window over there on your left side. And oh I said, God. okay, you got the airplane. He said, no, no, you have the airplane. You fly and you draw. <laughs> oh my. So that was kind of neat. That was kind of neat. But it, it you know, is very positive feedback. I could actually fly an airplane off the autopilot, off the autopilot at 300 feet, drawing the electrical system at the same time. I never had another problem with him, and he looked after me for the rest of my Navy career. It was really neat. Impressive. But yeah, yeah, it was more fun. I mean, if, I mean, you know, if, if you're out of Bermuda and you find a Russian submarine on top of the, top of the water because you located him, uh, that was really neat. Or if you're down in the, around the, Caribbean area and you're have to rig a ship and it turns out it's a yacht with you know with people on board and they're waving at you and you're waving back it's just a lot of fun you know we uh, went to a lot of different places so the navy uh like i said it's point a to point c with b in the middle of about eight hours just having fun doing things that you're that you want to do looking for submarines or looking for a particular ship so p3 was is a good airplane it was my favorite airplane in the navy but then when i got to fedex my favorite airplane was the airbus you know uh, the airbus 300 it, you know it's a heavy airplane uh, it was very comfortable two autopilots um, seems like the maintenance department always had everything in tip shop shape you know and it was uh, it was just fun to fly it's uh, you you take that airplane you can go down to zero zero or you can take off zero zero so Weather-wise, uh, the airplane was capable, and all we had to do was keep our current instrument rating so that we were current to take it down there. My favorite experience in, in uh, at FedEx was flying to Denver 
and getting in Denver. And they said that we were the last airplane because it was really snowing. The runway was covered with snow and the wind was this and the visibility, it was down to like a hundred feet. And so you come into Denver and you land the airplane and you get off the runway and they said the field is now closed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you feel really, really good. You felt really proud that you was able to accomplish that in conditions like they were. I didn't have that problem in the Navy, but uh, we, uh, I never operated in an area quite like that, uh, like in Denver or even in San Antonio, Texas. We went flew into San Antonio, Texas. We was in the Airbus 300 and the visibility was bad. We knew it was bad, but it was at minimum. So we land the airplane at minimums. We turn off the runway and guess what? You can't see the runway anymore. Yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't see you couldn't see lights. You couldn't see runway markings. So you had to call for a tow truck to come get you. <laughs> they get out to the airplane and we didn't see them coming. And they start knocking on the nose compartment yeah. there so that we knew that they were out there. It's just accomplishment that you can feel that you actually can do that. Every time you got a good scenario like that, there's always bad scenarios too. You know, like yeah. uh, maybe a near air, near air mist near or air something collision. like that, or hydraulic system going out. You know, there's so many things that can happen in the airplane. You just got to be ready for it, be trained for it. Yeah. What were some of your scariest moments that you remember? Well, I remember when I first joined the P3 squadron that we were over in uh, the Mediterranean Sea and we were supposed to hook up with an aircraft carrier, but we couldn't establish communications with them because it was all secret, you know, all covert. Mm -hmm. uh, we just couldn't let anybody know that we were there. And so we didn't know where they were because it was cloudy. It was the, we were flying in clouds the whole time. And the next thing we know, I was standing behind the flight engineer and looked up and there was a mountain. Oh. And uh, the captain immediately just yanked it into like a 45 or greater angle of bank uh, just to keep from running into the mountain and stuff. And uh, yeah, it was quite. Oh. It was quite serious. It was scary. Yeah. And uh, I guess that was probably the scariest situation I've ever been in, even though we almost had a midair collision with a little Cessna airplane that was out of uh, Philadelphia that was flying special VFR. Here we were at 500 feet, 500 feet going in for a landing, and this guy comes <laughs> oh, out wow. of nowhere and, and, and crosses right in front of us. I mean, it was just. Uh, that was nerve-wracking that was wow. scary yeah okay you've been to a lot of places you've been to you know a lot of airports what was your favorite airport that you landed at every one of them <laughs> <laughs> any of them more challenging no, than others? i love i'm like i'm like you i love airports i mean <laughs> you know it's just it's something different about every one of them uh, the way they are positioned, where they're laying, you know, next to the city or next to a river or right at the end of the the beach or something to that, like Bermuda. I mean, you know, Bermuda surrounded by water everywhere you look. And um, it was so wonderful to fly into Bermuda and, and see the different. San Francisco is a great place. I guess, uh, oh, I can't remember now if it was Reno or if it was Cheyenne that probably had the worst instrument approach i mean you had to you had to stay alert uh, to fly into there because it was so many different altitudes that you had to be at at a certain thing so you could clear this little hill you know they call the mountain yeah, and, uh, yeah. i like flying into vancouver vancouver you're flying that flying to vancouver and they got not a, a rain thunderstorm but they have a snow thunderstorm going on and it's just dodging thunderstorms while you're trying to land or flying near them when you're trying to land. But I don't have a favorite airport. I, I yeah. like them all. Well, I flew a, I think I told you I flew I, a, um, an approach. I don't know if I did a three or a two, but it was, uh, we were even, we were using the autopilot. It was in a simulator. It was a Boeing. I've never flown anything like, like that kind of approach with that you know, little that, I mean, you, you couldn't see anything. And yeah. I, even though I was in the simulator, I was sweating. I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> when are we going to land? I can't see anything. I mean, it's just, you're just totally trusting 
that the airplane is doing what it's supposed to do. No scary. Yeah, I, I did a a cat three. I did a cat three where we didn't see the runway either, you know, and you just you felt the nose, you felt the main mounts touch the runway without seeing the runway. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's nerve wracking. It's. Uh, I mean, you're on high alert. So I mean, does does it, did it get easier <laughs> as you did it, or you're just still every time is like high alert? It's easier in the simulator, but it is nerve wracking still once you're in the real airplane because you know you everything has got to work just perfectly. And at least in the simulator, if it doesn't work and you crash or whatever, you get to do it over again. But in the airplane, you know, it's got to be. You don't have a a second term yeah it's it's always uh, nerve-wracking to, to do an approach down the minimums uh, cat three type thing uh, cat two is the same way i mean really it's uh, in fact i think in san antonio it, they only have a cat two runway down there but the fog was moving in so fast we just didn't realize it you get used to doing the all the cat ones and stuff cat threes that's a different ball game. Yeah. Um, I know when I first started training and you and I had some conversations and I think I was talking about um, how much studying was required. I really didn't know how much studying was required and how, how it keeps going, even though I thought, okay, once I get my instrument rating, you know, I'll be fine. I'll be done. But there's something that made me want to go to the next level and I can see why. Uh, pilots okay so now i'm flying a citation jet well as a first officer but now i want to be a captain so i have to study for that and then it's like well i want to fly something bigger so it's always just like non-stop one of the things i tell people all the time is get used to studying <laughs> because you got to do it a every, lot <laughs> every airplane is different i meant you know, in the, in the P-3 and the Navy and stuff, you almost practically had to build the airplane even as a pilot because they wanted you to know what everything, every button did, every Zeus button, every whatever. They basically made you build the airplane. So you had to know the airplane. Uh, at FedEx and also at uh, Northwest Air Link, they taught you to fly the airplane rather than knowing. He said, well, that's what that red line is for and that gauge right there. Don't get near that, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Did you think it was beneficial so, to know that airplane so thoroughly? Well, when I was in the Navy, we was on the P3 stuff. We we used to do trivia, and somebody would come up with you know sixty psi, and so we had to guess what that sixty psi was or that type of question. And it was fun. I I really enjoyed it. it made you really realize that you know you got to keep in the books and you still got to remember all these numbers and stuff at fedex you know no you don't go to that extreme yeah and uh, it's still hard i'm not saying it's easy but uh it's not that really particular about a lot of the yeah the red line gauges and stuff when i started flying in the navy in the t-34 i started doing note cards and I had a note, I had note cards for T-34, note cards for T-28, S-2. I have note cards for 727, the DC-10. I mean, you got a whole stack. I had more for stacks for the DC-10 than I had for the Airbus, if you were to put mm -hmm. them up beside one another. But it's just quick refresher, uh, things that you need to know. And so uh, I had a whole handful of them. I, I just found it a whole lot easier to uh, study and remember uh, certain things that uh, that you were responsible for. How long have you been retired from FedEx? What year is this? Twenty two. <laughs> yes. That's about about eight years. Wow. You, do you miss it? I miss the excitement of going to. I uh, know I've been retired eleven years now. To think about, it. I retired in twenty eleven. I miss the excitement of going to different places, and getting out and seeing the sights, and going to different restaurants and. Uh, and, and things of that nature but the, the like i said the difference between the navy and uh, and fedex or the airlines is in the airlines you fly from a to b you know it's, there is no c in there it's just strictly take off go to another airplane uh, air, airport and land that can be kind of boring mm -hmm. uh, but uh, fun at the same time i just look forward to uh seeing the sights at a different place yeah. regardless of where i'm at my favorite 
of course, my favorite places to visit was overseas, uh, whether it's in Brazil or Bogota, Colombia, Panama, or Paris, France, or wherever. Places that you don't get to visit very often, but yet when you get to those places, you are able to get out for a couple of days and uh, and see what's there. I miss that part. Half suitcase, we'll travel. <laughs> Did you find that kind of schedule difficult when you flew for FedEx? For FedEx, yes, because uh, normally, you know, you have to get up to go to work sometime around midnight in order to get to the airplane and pre-flight it and, and take off. And then when you get to your destination, depending on where it's at, you would try to sleep in the daytime. Well, I have a hard time sleeping in the daytime. You have to darken your room up as much as possible. I did duct tape, whatever it takes to, to make it dark. But um, I found it hard to get adequate rest at FedEx. And that's just based on the time. I'm sure that's a struggle all the pilots there, right? It's not natural for us yeah. to sleep during the day. No, it's not. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, fatigue is a big thing at the, with FedEx. Fortunately, they had a policy that, you know, if you're fatigued, you call in and we'll find somebody else to fly for you. Well, being a pilot, you know, very few people, people will call in fatigue maybe the captain might call you in fatigue <laughs> yeah but uh, as far as you but as far as you calling in you know i never did i seen lots of people that should have and i saw myself on a couple of occasions when i should have too but uh, it's the can do spirit you know I, I had one i had one guy fall asleep on me that was climbing out oh i was gosh. the first officer and he was and he was a captain and he he actually fell asleep while he was climbing out in the airplane not on autopilot wow <laughs> i looked i looked i looked over at him and he was drooling from the mouth and i thought he was flying the airplane pretty good oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> what did you do i woke him up i yelled at him i said hey norm yeah oh yeah gosh. yeah i got it i got it i'm okay <laughs> wow that's crazy. You haven't flown um, since. No, I've been waiting for you to come pick me up so <laughs> I can get back in the airplane. <laughs> well, you had made a comment one time that you weren't really that interested in flying um, the smaller GA airplanes. Why do you think that is? I guess because I have flown big airplanes for, what, 40 years? Yeah. After I got out, after I got out of the T thirty four, initially I thought all the airplanes were big. <laughs> yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. Um, I know the last time I checked out a little Cessna one hundred and fifty and stuff. I mean, it, just, it was so bumpy, I mean, I was bouncing yeah. around everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And uh, you really don't experience that much in in the big airplane uh, unless you're just wanting to wake yourself up and fly through some clouds or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I just. I just don't know. Uh, I I get on highs and lows. Sometimes I'm ready to go out and buy me an airplane, and then I'm thinking, well, why would I want to do that? I don't care anything about going back flying again. Yeah. And then next thing I know, I want to buy an airplane, and then I don't. Of course, yeah. I would never be able. I'm too old to fly 121 rules, but 135, you know, and 90s, you know, I I probably could do that. Yeah. You gonna buy me an airplane? <laughs> I did not know this was, that was where this conversation was going to lead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could be the captain. I'd be the co-pilot. That, that would be fun. But Maybe you someday. Fly down here and pick never up say there. never. <laughs> no, I, you and I have not flown together. I haven't flown you um, in, a, in a little airplane. One of these days I'm going to, though. I know. I can't wait to see, if, you know, which way is up and which way is down. <laughs> <laughs> well we well, are um going to wrap up i appreciate you sharing all that uh, what we always do at the end of our episodes are ask the guest because this is called cockpits and cocktails and let's say you landed at denver what would be i know you don't drink a lot but what would be your cocktail adult beverage of choice that is tough because you know i don't drink very much um <clears throat> If I was landing in Denver, I don't know. You know, margaritas, always, I guess margaritas is my yeah. favorite drink. Yeah. I can't stand scotch. And I can't stand gin. I, I can't stand vodka. So amaretto would be good. Amaretto sour would be good, too. Yeah. That sounds Sweet. good. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dad, for coming on. I appreciate it. Brandy uh, won. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fly, fly me down one. Put All it in right. the cooler and fly me down one. How about I fly down and then we go get one? All right. That's work too. All right. Thank you again. And we will talk soon. Thank you to everyone who tuned into this episode of Cockpits and Cocktails. Please make sure you subscribe. Let us know if you have any questions or you have any guests that you'd like to hear on the show. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>